But yeah, I'm super grateful for your invitation to come speak to your class. And even though my field now is not technically anthropology anymore, culture, studying culture and humans in general is still something very dear to my heart. It's just that now I have focused more on language, in particular in education. And um, today I call my presentation, Your Face Sounds Familiar, Hearing and Seeing Accents. And I titled it this way because when Kevin asked me to talk about language and culture, I, and he said that a lot of students are very interested in topics of accents and things like that, I immediately thought of this um, TV show that we have in the Philippines, and I'm pretty sure it was adopted from, uh, from somewhere else. But the TV show was called Your Face Sounds Familiar, and basically based on people's, uh, how they present themselves visually, uh, the, the, the players in the game, because it's like a game show, they try to guess which ones of um, the people presented to them are singers or non-singers based solely on how they act, how they look. And um, it's kind of now the, uh, not reverse, but also something very similar along those lines, but also the reverse when it comes to um, seeing accents. And because today I want to talk to you about um, the kinds of face value judgments that we hear or that we make whenever we interact with people, particularly uh, with ones who we perceive to be accented or having a foreign accent or a non-native accent. Um, and I want to premise that Again, my, my research is mostly geared within the context of ed language education so, and language policy. So you might hear me all throughout the presentation um, refer to uh, examples that, that stem from those contexts. Um, but in general, of course, hearing accents and making judgment about people's accents, it, it just doesn't happen in the classroom, right? It happens everywhere happens on the streets. So I think this is a, a very interesting topic for me, even though it's not my research focus, but it's also something that I care a lot about personally as someone who used to sound differently. I used to not sound like this with my English because English is also my second language. Um, and you know, it's, it's a very loaded topic. But anyways, let's get started. Um, so just a little bit of an outline of what, what I wanna do. I want to start just a little bit by presenting some um, theories, at least the ones that I'm familiar with from a more linguistic side, where we see language and culture as something that's very interrelated. And then I'll go right into some of the issues that I wanted to talk about today, um, particularly my key terms are ling linguicism, linguistic imperialism, and linguistic racism, um, and how these manifest due to that connection between language and culture. And in particular, I want to go over some examples um, from different sources about what we hear when we act when we process someone's accent, right? And specifically, I want to talk about the fact that when someone speaks, we can kind of hear the race or ethnic identity. Um, some people, when they speak, we make judgments about where where they came from. Um, and in various other examples, especially in the workplace, the way that people sounds like their accent has um, now kind of start influencing how we judge their levels of professionalism, um, even their gender identities and their overall skills and competences. And to kind of present some potential quote unquote and solutions or potential futures to go um, to go to from this kind of um, mess that we have because of linguicism, I would want to talk about something that uh, I research, which is plurilingualism, or this idea of plurality and how we can um, change the way we think about differences. Uh, and, and instead of problematizing it, thinking about it in a way where perhaps it's actually more useful than uh, and less of a problem. So language and culture. Um, I want to start with a quote from Noam Chomsky. Um, perhaps you guys have learned about him in this class. He's a very popular linguist. Um, he's still around, even though he's pretty old. But uh, he once said, a language is not just words. It's a culture, a tradition, 
a unification of a community. And um, it's a whole history that, sorry, I'm just gonna move this, whoa. Uh, people's pictures are on the way of my slides here and can't seem to see the, there we go. Um, a whole history that creates what a community is, you know, language is embodied. Sorry for the interruption. Um, and it's very interesting to hear this from him because if you guys, you guys might be aware, but Noam Chomsky came up with this idea of universal grammar, right? And he argued that people's capacity to use and learn language is something that's biologically innate. There's some sort of linguistic device in our brains and that's what makes us all capable of language. And for him, you know, he's like universal grammar deals a lot with syntax, grammar, um, like this more symbolic, iconic type of uh, definition for language. But, and so it's so refreshing for him to say something like this. And I wanna preface my presentation with this because this is how I define language. And it was interesting because in the chat, when I just entered, I saw that there was a little bit of a discussion about what language means. And just, you know, to, to guide uh, you throughout my presentation and how I see language, this is how I define language. Language is embodied. It's not just a set of letters that stands for sounds, um, which has meanings, etc. It's not, language is not just that. Language is what I wear, how I use my hands, what I express through my face, um, body piercings and tattoos, silence. For me, all of that is language, right? And I mean, if we think about the very digital and technological wor world that we have today, language really is the internet too, our profile pictures, right? Um, uh, those types of personality um, that we express, say, you know, I, I play video games and, you know, we don't put our real names as, as a name to our online selves, right? There's a whole language to that. That's part of expression. Anything that we use symbolically to express meaning, for me, that's language. So I want to start with that. And in that sense, it's not going to be surprising that language and culture are very related. And there's this very popular hypothesis that's used both in anthropology and linguistics um, called saper whorf hypothesis, sometimes referred to as linguistic relativism. And the idea is that language directly or indirectly depends on how strongly you want to believe in the hypothesis language and or language influences our worldview right because if you think about it our memories our thoughts our experiences most of the time it's coded in language and when we access it right if you want to tell me a story you're going to access it from your brain through language and you're going to express it through language so our thought is literally mediated through language whether it's oral, written, um, or some sort of tactile linguistic expression or sign language as well, right? Um, and this is really interesting in applied linguistics. This has been kind of reformulated into this expression called thinking for speaking to the point that literally what I'm saying right now is the most accurate, well, I wouldn't say I guess the most accurate, but it's the closest that you can get to my thought is based on what you're hearing from me, what I'm saying, right? And th th this manifests too in different languages grammars. If you think about it, languages like English um, have phrasal verbs where the verb codes not only the action, but the manner of the action. You know, like, is it going across something? Is it going up? Is it going down, right? Sometimes directionality or spatial relations can be coded into an action. And in some verbs like, or in some languages like French, for instance, uh, we cannot do that. We need to use two different words or two different um, morphemes to code action and spatial relationships. But for some languages, particularly Germanic ones, um, it can be done in one, one, one expression. Collocations as well. Collocations refer to words that co-occur most normally in a language. So for example, um, in English, we say, uh, you, we make a decision. In French, we say, we take a decision, right? And that might be something that's very minute, but if you think about it, if you dissect that, it, making a decision is very different from taking one. Um, and I'm trying to think now how we say it in Tagalog, uh, 
I think it's just to have a decision. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, these little things really show us how we think about, say, decision, for instance. And some other examples include, I just ran across this uh, on Twitter, I think, is um, collocations with the word attention. In English, we say we pay attention, right? Um, in French, we say faire attention, which means to make attention. And I think in Spanish, correct me if there's any Spanish speakers here, because I just saw this online. Apparently in Spanish, people would say um, lend attention, right? And that the different verbs that go with that, that collocate with attention tells us in that culture, how that culture treats attention, right? Is it paid, is it made, or is it lent, right? And of course, idioms too, um, it's, it's very cultural. It's, it, if, if you're not familiar with a culture and you're learning a second language, it's very difficult to decode idioms because your cultural references are vastly different. And one example I have is in English, we say, when pigs fly, in French, we say, when chickens grow teeth, and in Tagalog, we say, when uh, crows, become white or turn white. And um, I have no clue the origins of all of these cultural references, but it's very interesting to see how the same idiomatic meanings are coded differently in different language because of how sensitive it is to the available cultural references. And of course, gender as well, gender expression and gender coding. There's some languages um, where gender is grammatical, right? Like French, and it's a big topic right now in French education um, because of the increasing awareness that we have about gender identity and things like uh, transgender people and how they want to, you know, center um, their gender experiences um, in their, uh, you know, about them versus, say, the heteronormative um, discourse that we usually have, which is the current st state of affairs, right? But it's hard to do that. It's, it's hard to say, just openly express their gender identities if there's a clear cut coded gender in the language that prevents you from being grammatically understood if you deviate from, from the appropriate quote unquote appropriate grammar. And one way of thinking about language as culture as well is to think about where does language come from, right? And one of the things that I really love right now is reading about usage-based linguistics where um, literally linguists define language or the emergence of language is coming from something that's very social. Um, the language comes from the way people use it. It comes from our interaction um, and it comes from, you know, that's why language is so susceptible to change because societies are susceptible to change and cultures are susceptible to change and as those change and the way we communicate and use language change, then the language itself changes. And I really like that. Um, and also there's sociocultural theory by this Russian psychologist, uh, Vygotsky, and he was kind of very popular for coining this term. Um, however, there's a little bit of a misnomer here, I think, because I feel like people think that he was totally talk, talking about something sociological or anthropological when he came up with the name social cultural theory. Um, but what he's trying to say is that children and even adult language learners pick up language through interaction with one's social cultural environment. And that environment includes people and it includes um, materials in that environment, right? Like tools, like books, like YouTube videos, songs, um, literature, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but a main kind of message about this is this is kind of like what I'm saying, it's a bit of a misnomer, is that even though he called it sociocultural theory, his thesis is that cognition is social. He's still a psychologist after all, but he was arguing that our mind is not here, it's out here, right? Like, and I really like this as well because it goes back to usage-based linguistics where language and other forms of knowledge and meanings are co-constructed between and among people, right? And that's what it means for cognition to be social. Uh, it's not just up here that I'm producing knowledge, it's through us, it's between us, things like that. Of course, examples of this is uh, 
like picking up habits from people, right? Like if you meet someone new and, you know, you, you start becoming close with them and they start doing something linguistically, whether it be some kind of pattern, right? I remember I had this person, I met her, we became friends and um, her kind of pragmatics in order for her to let me know that she's still listening to what I'm saying. Every time I speak, she would always say, yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought that was interesting. At first it bothered me, but then after a while I started picking it up and that's literally usage-based linguistics. Like it became part of my English language because of my interaction with this new person. And of course, if you think of larger scales um, types of interactions, we have language contacts um, that resulted to things like Creoles or pidgin languages um, and even languages like Tagalog, for instance, um, where we see the Philippines go through um, two to three different colonial powers, the Spaniards, the Americans, later the Japanese too, but I don't think they were there long enough to give us a language. But Tagalog is very much highly influenced by Spanish and English because of the colonial history and the language contact that occurred through that uh, colonial past, right? And regional varieties as well. Uh, it's interesting to see how, um, say, if, even if we look at just England, right, or the UK, where you, one can argue it's where English originated, but England alone has so many different accents and regional varieties of the exact same language. And this tells us that really language has this ability to become so local, right, in its context, really based on how people are using it. And same is true for Canadian English. We might not think about it, but most of the time I have troubles understanding people speaking English from say Toronto, because they, I don't know, just the way they speak. Um, and I don't have this video right now, but I remember seeing this video where they asked Canadians from across the country to read the same poem. And it's just so cool to hear how differently um, first language speakers of English across Canada would read the same text very differently just because, you know, their language, including the way they pronounce it, arose specifically in how it's used locally. And in that sense, whoops, uh, this is why I shouldn't have put animations. Um, but in that sense, we see how the bottom line is just, I just really want to uh, send this message that language and culture are like highly intertwined and you know this interconnection manifests in things that maybe we even take for granted uh, because it's so commonplace um, and in that sense now I want to move on to issues of linguism, linguistic imperialism and linguistic racism uh, which are more sociocultural issues that are made visible through language or that operate through language um, as Kevin has introduced me, I kind of identify as a critical applied linguist. So my kind of general worldview is that language is always implicated in issues of social inequities, social injustice, social discrimination, and things like this. And this is what I uh, want to talk about today, but in particular, I will focus on accent. Um, maybe not right away, but eventually. So what is linguism? Linguism in general is just a fancy term to say language-based discrimination. Uh, academics, we love to invent new stuff like this just to make us sound smarter. Um, I really don't know why. Uh, again, English is my second language. So sometimes I come across words like this and I'm like, was this really necessary? Um, or are we just trying to gatekeep knowledge from people who might not speak English as well as we do, right? Um, but as an academic and a linguist, this is kind of like my tension right now because now I speak academic English and it's tough. Now I feel like I'm participating in knowledge uh, gatekeeping. But anyhow, going back to linguism, um, there are many different types of this. And one example is linguistic imperialism, um, which specifically refers to how language-based discrimination happens in terms of larger uh, power structure, such as how, how are we able to enact dominance through language, right? So examples of these include policies, um, of course, colonialism, as I've mentioned, other types of structural violences, such as um, linguistic genocide, um, and even the capitalist regimes, uh, right? 
Um, if you think about it, for instance, in our capitalist world, many products we consume in English speaking nations are not produced in English speaking nations. And in that way, we can tell which language is more prestigious, which is more powerful, which has more imperial um, capital, right? Um, which is English, of course. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting. And then we look at the bottom of the product and say, oh, made in India, made in China, made in the Philippines, and you know, places where labor can be cheap. But how come nothing of the product is, you know, is embodying the language from which it uh, from where it was produced, right? That's imperialism at its finest. Um, and one other form of linguism is linguistic racism, which is technically racism through language or language-based racism. And a specific example of this, or like a new term that's kind of gaining popularity nowadays, is accentism. Um, because everybody's hung up on everyone's accents. And so I'll talk about that in a second. But um, just to clarify more what it means for language to be a vehicle of, um, you know, social inequities and injusti injustice and things like that. Uh, there's a linguist from the University of Toronto, um, Dr. Sanders, where he said that a major factor that allows unjust social structures is language, right? Because some languages are considered prestigious, some languages are considered neutral, while some languages or some variety of a language um, would be more dominant. And if you speak that dominant language, then you have access to more things. And again, a very quick example that we have right now is English. If I don't speak academic English, if I never learned academic English, I would not, have had the chance to be in a PhD program and be funded for it and all of that good stuff, right? Um, and it's all because I spoke English. Um, and so this is really how it works, right? And so sometimes for us who have access to education, um, it can boil down to language and language barriers. And if you think about it, Canada receives so, I don't know if some of you are, maybe, maybe not, um, but Canada receives so many international students and one of the requirements to um, enroll in a post-secondary institution in Canada is to pass exams such as TOEFL and IELTS. And literally these exams are so expensive um, and they take up so much of your time because they do not just happen every day. You have to find a schedule where you can write them. And again, in this way, you know, if I cannot afford it, if I don't have time to do it, then I'll just never get into a post-secondary institution right? Whether or not I'm actually capable to be in one, but just because of these um, language assessments, I'm deprived of that opportunity. And in this way, we really see how languages and um, some dialects of language are not all treated e equally. And, you know, through this, um, many societies have been able to denigrate, ridicule, or even like just outright oppress mm -hmm. and kill off um, um, Yes, and you know, if we think about, for instance, African American vernacular English, um, it's very interesting how it's so kind of ridiculed, or it's seen as something less than standard North American English in a country like America, where literally you brought all of these people from across the world to enslave them. You got rid of their language, and now that they started using your language in their own way you were gonna call them stupid. How does that make sense? It's just totally oppressive. It does not make sense. You know, if we think about it, the fact that a whole population of people who has gone through trauma such as slavery had been displaced and yet we're still able to creatively use someone else's language and make them their own. That's the opposite of being stupid. That's like super intelligent and creative. And yet because of certain unjust social structures, right? The way we frame um, certain language varieties. Um, it's always usually the native, the native speaking idealized white monolingual speaker is usually put on top um, and everyone else's language use and language practice um, is seen as not enough. And I wanna like now focus on linguistic imperialism in particular. And I know I've been talking a lot about see, 
colonial examples, the US, but now I wanna focus, shift gear into looking at how these terms operate in our own society here in Canada. And I wanna kind of go back to a little bit of theory and talk about some ways that again, language and culture is, is, are seen as one in the same in, in, in certain ways. And one example of this is um, what Maconi and Pennycook call as like one language, one nation, where we're typically taught um, to think of language as a representation of an entire culture or an entire nation, right? If we think about it, what does the country uh, of France speak? French. What does Germany speak? German, right? What does England speak? English, right? So this type of cultural national identity is coded in the language itself that um, this nation speak. But for some anthropologists like Maconi and some linguists like Penico, um, they theorize how these types of naming language after its nation was born out of um, the colonial conquest. Because when colonial powers started going outside of Europe, they're realizing that there are regions in the world where language variety is normal. Um, you know, they went to India and realized there's so many different places in India that each has that each uh, speaks a different language, and that was hard for them to kind of, you know, that's not part of their worldview. Their worldview: England is English, French is uh, France is French. You know, things like this, and so they wanted to impose that same worldview um, into countries like India. Because if you think about it, we don't say that India speaks Indian. They don't, right? Um, it depends on where you are. You, you might be speaking, I'm not very familiar with Indian languages, but um, Punjabi, for instance, Hindi, um, another example, Bangla, right? Um, there's so many. And this is kind of like something that we inherited um, from that past where most of the time when we think of a, of a nation, we want to assume that the language they speak comes from the name of their nation as well. But in reality, it's really not. Um, because as I said, India, they don't speak Indian. In the Philippines, surely you can say we speak Filipino, but Filipino slash Tagalog is really just one of the 200 languages that we have in the Philippines. And if you look at the continent of Africa, we don't say they speak African. Um, and this is kind of like a, a pet peeve of mine when people say, oh, some, uh, this person doesn't speak Chinese. Um, you can kind of get away with that, but Chinese is not exactly a language too. Um, there's over 200 languages in China as well, even though the only official lang language is Mandarin. Um, they also have their own sort of very reductionist language policy there. I'm not an expert, so I don't want to comment too much on what's going on in there. Um, but there's, there are many language varieties in China alone, and people don't definitely speak Chinese. They speak either man Mandarin and a local dialect. And if we even think about it in our context here in North America, in the U.S., we don't say people speak American, right? In Canada, we don't speak Canadian. We literally have the Official Languages Act that says that we're officially English and French bilingual. Speaking of which, um, let's take a look where it came from. Um, so the Official Languages Act, before it was officialized sometimes in the 70s, it first came from the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism. Again, we see here the interrelationship of language and culture. Um, and this was a speech given from the Royal Commission uh, in the House of Commons uh, when they were suggesting that Canada should definitely have an English and French official law. And they said, to recommend what steps should be taken to develop the Canadian con Confederation on the basis of an equal partnership between the two founding races, right? Um, yeah, I, every time I read this, I just, I, I freeze. Uh, it's just aggressively colonial, at least the way I see it, where, first of all, it's not like the English and the French founded Canada, maybe the notion of it, but Canada has always existed way before the English and the French came here, right? Um, but then again, the fact that we have two official languages on the basis of two founding, uh, two quote-unquote founding races, right? We see here not only the interrelationship between language and culture, language and race, but also 
linguistic imperialism. And, you know, we see, he, we see this even more locally, um, at least I do here in Quebec, where I'm currently at, where I'm teaching and researching language, where we have an, a French only policy, which is a la charte de la langue française, um, where literally French is technically the only language of the state, of the law, of work and commerce, of communication and education, um, and of businesses, right? And all of us, of all of our signs here must exist um, in French um, or French and English, but French definitely has to be there. And with the most of uh, the current government, they changed the name, for example, of um, this Ministry for Immigration, Diversity and Inclusion, and they changed it to Immigration, Francisation and uh, Integration. So we see the shift of language here alone tells us the intention uh, of what this ministry means by integration, right? Here you have inclusion and diversity. Here you have integration through what? Through francisation. And francisation refers to, um, uh, what do you call this? It refers to, basically it's a program wherein immigrants uh, who are newly uh, newcomers to Quebec, they need to learn French and they go through these classes and it's called francisation. Um, and for this ministry here in the government, they, they, they view integration into Quebec society and culture through French language learning, um, which is very different from say, just, you know what, come here, learn French, but it's cool if you speak your own language too. But uh, for me as a language teacher and researcher, presenting your goal as francisation, like to Frenchify someone, if you want to, uh, translated in French, it's, it's a very loaded term, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and surprisingly, I've been doing some research on language policies and Alberta is one of the other only language, uh, only province in Canada that has an English only policy. It's not as strict in Alberta because um, most provinces across Canada just follow the Official Languages Act where in English and French are both equally prioritized. Um, but Alberta does have the Languages Act where in English is the only official language of the province, um, but because the constitution protects both English and French, um, Albertans are able to uh, access service and education in French as well. And this is again, kind of like in my own work in education where language, culture, uh, and linguistic imperialism comes through. If you look at what um, our first prime minister, John A. Macdonald said, um, and this is, once again, he spoke to the House of Commons um, with this, and he was talking about the, the residential schools, right? And how it, it should really try to um, educate uh, indigenous children um, with the English and or the French language. And he said, when the school is on the reserve, the child lives with its parents. It, my gosh. Uh, who are savages. And though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. It has been strongly impressed upon myself as head of the department that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes of thought of white men, right? And this is one of the biggest reason why in residential schools, Indigenous children were punished, right? And sometimes even um, killed for speaking uh, their indigenous languages because language carries that culture, that thought. And this is, there's just no other way to put it. This, this was an example of uh, cultural genocide and linguistic imperialism. And, you know, because of this history, it might not be surprising for many of us to learn that there are now more second language speakers uh, of indigenous language than first language speakers. So this means that many uh, of our indigenous, um, uh, indigenous brothers and sisters are growing up speaking English and or French as a first language, right? And honestly, that sucks. <laughs> For a language researcher and educator like me, it's just, there's no other way to put it. It, it sucks. Um, because there is continuous language loss and uh, 
sometimes a lot of us like to think of Canada as a post-colonial nation, um, but in terms of how there's still cultural and language loss, particularly for Indigenous um, Canadians, maybe we're not post-colonial after all. And um, yeah, and it's just, I just wanted to point out as well that many, many a time Sioux, of course, even, even though they're picking, picking it up as their first or second, uh, as their first language, I mean, English or French as their first language, many of the times, a lot of indigenous peoples who speak English as an L1 or French as an L1, many um, non-indigenous listeners uh, who, who listen to indigenous people speak they do not perceive it as like their English first language or French first language is good enough. Again, this goes into accent as well. Um, for in my, to be clearer, uh, I'll give an example. For instance, my boyfriend, he uh, works for um, a phone service provider, provider and uh, he's a client care agent. And he always tells me that, oh, I always have difficulty speaking to people calling from the reserves. Um, something about, uh, you know, their language, the way they speak, or maybe the type of English they learn. And I tell him, you know, they speak English as a first language most of the time, right? And he just looks at me and he's puzzled and he's like, yeah, but there's something wrong about it. I'm like, no, there's nothing wrong about it. That's just how they learned it. It's, it's their first language. How can there be anything wrong with it, right? And perhaps what, what I'll allude now is perhaps what we're having problems with is uh, how we listen and, and, and not the speech that we're listening to itself. Um, so on that note, I wanna now focus on linguistic racism and kind of leave behind linguistic imperialism and talk more about um, how that happens. And for some anthropologists like uh, H. Sami Alim, um, Jonathan Rosa, uh, they kind of came up with this idea of racial linguistics where they say that language and race are co-constructed. So that means whenever we perceive someone's language, we assume something about their race or vice versa. Whenever we see someone, we assume about the type of language uh, that they would produce. And um, very recently as well, um, there was a, a research that I read from Ustendorp and this, I think this was in Denmark or I'm not sure if it's Denmark or South Africa, um, but in, in like uh, a, a context where there are like white and black speakers of the dominant language in society. And apparently um, the speakers of color, their language, even though they're speaking the standard variety, um, it's always perceived through um, through a racialized lens, that their language is automatically racialized, whether or not they sound native, whether or not they have an accent, it's just the way they look influences the way people will hear what they say. What they say. And uh, yeah, Jonathan Rosa, he came up with this book uh, based on an ethnography that he conducted in a, I think in a, in a school in Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and he studied his uh, Hispanophones learning in, in, in a majoritively English speaking school. Um, and the book is called Looking Like a Language, Sounding Like a Race. And I really like the pun there. Um, and I think it simply, like, simply but elegantly expresses what I've been trying to say about racial linguistics here that sometimes we look like a language and sometimes we sound like a race. And um, some other ling uh, linguistic anthropologists too, like Del Himes, maybe you guys have learned about him from the class. Um, he also came up with this idea of speech communities, right? That again, kind of language that we do is very much tied to the practices that we have with our local communities, with the people that we interact with. And an example that I have is for instance, I've never said sorry and thank you as much as I do now, you know, before I moved to Canada because the sorry and thank you expression is very much part of the Canadian speech, English speech community. Um, it's very local to hear. There's also this idea of spatial repertoires um, that Pennycook is talking about, where he's kind of saying that maybe language, uh, 
and language use is very particular to where it's happening. So, excuse me, for instance, um, the kind of language that you use at work, especially say if you work at a restaurant, is going to be very different from the kind of language that you would use to write an assignment, say, for your class here with Kevin. Um, and and yeah, and of course, the kind of English that I'm using right now is going to be very different from the kind of English that I speak with my parents at home, if I ever speak with them in English. Sometimes I do, but most of the time it defeats the purpose of effective communication if I'm using a language that, that they're not able to access as easily as I do, right? Um, and yeah, as I will talk about now, accentism comes from this idea of racial linguistics and race repertoires. And, and comments that I used to hear a lot, like, you sound like you were born here. Um, I didn't know that being born somewhere particular has a specific sound. Um, don't we all cry the same? Uh, most children, the first phoneme or sound they're able to produce is the ah, because it's literally just open your mouth and ah. And most cries is like, ah, ah right? That's how you sound wherever you were born. But again, this has to do with accentism and race repertoires. Um, yeah, and on that note, I'll move on now to accentism. And I wanna start with this idea of accent hallucination. So there's, um, actually I'll switch my screen here in a sec, but accent, actually, no, I'll just switch my screen here now. And um, there's this idea of accent hallucination where uh, apparently, based on what people see in front of them, they might interpret the, the speech they're hearing to be, to be more accented or less accented. Um, but there's a podcast here from some linguists that were talking about it that I'll just let you guys listen to them. They explain it more elegantly than I would. Mm, okay, so accent hallucination. Now let's get into that. Um, <laughs> so are we imagining an accent? What is this? Yes. So... So the, the, this is a study from 1990, but the findings have been since replicated. So this is so, pretty solid research. Mm -hmm. um, so the study took college students and presented them with audio and mm -hmm. also at the same time with a photograph. So okay. half of the students got a photograph of a white woman professor mm -hmm. and half of them got a, a, a professor who was of Asian descent. And the people like, not everybody, obviously, but uh, the people who listened to the picture, the, the audio with a white woman mm -hmm. uh, heard an American accent, a standard American accent. And the, uh, many of the people who were presented with the picture of the woman of Asian descent heard a quote unquote foreign accent. They heard an Asian mm. uh, accent, which was not there. It was the same audio. Wow. So the exact same audio, and yet people heard an accent with one and not the other. Right. So we can see that our perceptions influence what we see and what we hear, right? So in this case, what... We I'll stop there for the interest of time. Um, but yeah, just to reiterate what they basically uh, said, uh, right, that just switching the image in front of us, even though it's literally the same speech, will make us think that, oh yeah, of course, this English is accented because there's a picture of an Asian woman in front of me. And uh, they were talking about how the first study was conducted in the US in 1990, and it was more recently replicated in Canada. Um, I think early 2000s or maybe mid 2000s. Um, so it's very interesting that it's more of a North American phenomenon. And I'm not gonna be surprised if it's a thing across the world, um, but yeah. And it's, it, I have experienced this myself. I was speaking French to uh, a Francophone one time and, and he was like, oh, your French has a, has a his, uh, Hispanic accent. And I was like, oh yeah, that's totally impossible because I do not speak Spanish, right? Like there's no way, like how can I have an accent from a language I do not speak? And he was just like, no, I'm pretty sure you do. Trust me, I'm a linguistic student, which made it even worse. Um, and he was just like, you definitely have a Hispanic accent when you speak French. And I'm just like, that's, I, I'm telling you, that's physically, logically, magically impossible <laughs> because I do not speak Spanish. But most people uh, perceive me as a Spanish speaker and that can influence how they hear me, right? 
And so one of the things that we hear when we listen to people is their race or their ethnicity, uh, ethnic identities and affiliations even, right? And uh, another example I have here, I'm not gonna play it, I originally intended to, but I think I'm taking up uh, too much time, is uh, if you've never seen it before, I highly recommend watching this movie called Sorry to Bother You. And it's a movie about um, these uh, telemarketers um, who are trying to sell as, you know, like trying to, I suppose, earn as much commissions as they can in a month and whatnot. And there's this scene here where the more veteran employee was telling the newbie to like, you know, just use your white voice. You see white boys and people will buy more stuff from you. They'll, they'll tend to believe you. Um, and it's kind of funny because the way they portrayed it in the movie, they literally have um, white voice actors dub over um, the black actors. Uh, and at first it's very uh, jar jarring, but after a while you see that it was the point of the movie and it makes you think. Um, if we look at say, journalists of color that we see on TV, like especially those who get anchor positions, they usually do not sound like what we stereotypically would think of what a black person would sound like or what an Asian person would sound like, right? And I'm not saying that, you know, if you're Asian or if you're black or if you're, you know, non-white and you sound white, that it's a bad thing. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there is some sort of relationship again between um, what we look like, what we sound like, especially for professional contexts. Um, but yeah, after watching the movie, I started kind of like being conscious about myself and I'm like, oh my God, am I speaking with a white voice? Do I have a white voice when I'm teaching ESL? Um, but yeah, it's, just, it's a very interesting movie. Weird ending though. Um, and I kind of already talked about this, but yeah, like comments like you sound like you were born here or like, oh, you were an immigrant, you, weren't, you didn't grow up here. How come your English is so good, right? Again, these are examples of how we hear place or belonging or origin based solely on um, someone's accent or someone's speech patterns. Um, and there's so many other things. Um, just recently, right, there's this, just earlier this year, there's this BBC article about how pervasive linguistic racism is in, pro in, in workplaces and how um, many uh, employees of color are usually, um, you know, judged down in terms of um, their work, their professionalness, professionalism, um, their competences as a worker based solely on not speaking the standard variety of the accent. Um, and I was also, uh, I plan to show this video for you, but I sent Kevin the PDF of this and you can just click on the picture. It will link you to the video. It's a three minute video of a psychologist talking about the kinds of things that we judge people on when we hear their when we hear their accent and just to summarize she was talking about how sometimes if you have an accent people think you're less credible sometimes people think that you're less trustworthy um, or in some cases especially for language teachers sometimes you're seen as less authoritative that you're not able to like be assertive enough to to manage your classroom and things like this and Again, we don't just hear accents, we hear skills, we hear all these things. And some other examples too is this very recent study from the journal language, uh, Brain and Language, where they asked the, their participants in the research to judge how good their English is globally on a scale of heavily accented to native-like, right? And there's no correlation whatsoever between someone's accent and their ability to write or speak a language. There's really no correlation whatsoever. But in this study that was published, you know, this is like modern day science. Um, and we're still kind of putting out this knowledge out there that, oh yeah, if you're heavily accented, then perhaps your global English proficiency is low as well. No, there's no correlation whatsoever. Um, and in, in some other, in this another study at the University of Toronto, um, engineering, international engineering students were sometimes perceived as not masculine enough because of their accent, just because apparently it sounds more feminine. Um, or sometimes they, they're perceived as um, less kind of commanding when it comes to when they present orally and things like that, um, just because 
of their accents. Like, for me, that's just mind boggling. Um, how can you know someone about someone's uh, sexuality or gender identity just out of their accent? Um, but yeah, and this is very recent as well. This is like happening now, right? Um, and this is kind of like the penultimate study uh, that was done in Australia where they just looked at um, additional, uh, English as an additional language speaker um, in Australia, particularly from migrant backgrounds and how, you know, they, based on solely on their accent, they get judged on, um, you know, like their, their culture, their race, their ethnicity, gender, all of these things are encoded um, in the way they speak and the way they're heard by all of these people. Um, and they, you know, would suffer through mockery, jokes, sexualization even. Um, and this is, uh, this just came out, like, I think now, like fall, I think I'm pretty sure it came across this, like just this fall. Um, and it's, it's just not, it's, uh, it's sad. It's very sad. Um, but, you know, you might be wondering, well, should we not learn about speaking with a native-like accent then? Um, and this is something that I tell my students all the time. So uh, Jordan is probably very familiar with this concept already. But actually, for pronunciation researchers, we do not only talk about accent. Um, we talk about things such as comprehensibility which is the listener's perception of how easy or difficult someone is to be understood. There's also intelligibility, which is how much did you actually understand someone's speech, right? So comprehensibility is usually measured through a scale, like um, was that difficult to understand from zero to 10, you know, something like that. Whereas intelligibility is like, okay, transcribe what you're listening to. And based on that, we can actually measure how much is understood. And based on many research done on this, there's actually no correlation between accentedness and intelligibility. Most of the time, people can be accented and perfectly intelligible. What research found on the other hand is that there is some correlation between people's perception of how hard or easy it is to comprehend someone and their, ac and their accent. And so if someone is strongly accented, people would tend to think that they're harder to understand whether or not it's actually true. Okay. And this really speaks to the fact that perhaps it's not about teaching second language speakers or language learners in general how to speak better, but maybe teaching us as listeners learning how to listen better, because that's usually not something that taught to us in language schools, language classrooms, right? And just to end, I think I'm, I'm going to go through the, here because I uh, already took up too much time. just want to end with this idea that uh, from Robert uh, Leighton Wade, where they said monolingualism is the illiteracy of the 21st century. And I really love this quote, but I want to push this further because I just, just talked about language and culture and things like that. And I want to maybe pose the question that perhaps monolingualism and monoculturalism, oops, are the illiteracy of the 21st century. And especially we can see how Canada is changing. I'll just go through it right now. And this is kind of like how my research is responding to that. If we look at languages, aside from the official English and French spoken across Canada, uh, we see in the prairies, Tagalog <laughs> speakers are flocking in, um, but we also have uh, Punjabi speakers in BC. Of course, we have Inuktitut um, in Northwest, uh, no, this is Northwestern territories. This is uh, Nunavut. Um, and of course, Mandarin speakers in Ontario, Arabic speakers um, in Quebec, which is not surprising because many Arabic speaking nations used to be French colonies, right? Um, and Montagne as well, which is an Inu language um, in, uh, this is Prince, Prince Edward Islands? Or Newfoundland, Newfoundland, sorry. Oh, my Canadian geography is pretty bad. Um, and so this is kind of like where my research comes in and I'll finish with this, um, the idea of plurilingualism, right? Where we see plurality, not as a problem, but as a good thing, as a resource um, to make society stronger, more diverse. And, you know, in, in my research in language classroom, my thesis is that the more languages you know, the easier it is to learn a new one, which makes sense. 
And if you think about it, even monolingual speakers, even if you tell me, but John, I only speak English. Sure, but I'm pretty sure you understand British English. You might be able to copy the accent. You understand Texan English from the Southern United States, right? Yeah, you know many variety of the same one language that makes you plural, that makes you a plurilingual in a sense. Um, and yeah, I have another example here about translanguaging, which is sometimes the other term used if not plurilingualism. And this is an example of a menu here in Montreal which, where you see it's a Filipino restaurant. So there are some words in Tagalog, but there's always French. But as Jordan was saying in the chat, the English is always more small than the French. Um, and in, in this case here, some of the words are in Tagalog. So it's not translatable, so it's the biggest one. But in cases where it can be translated to French like Chou de Bruxelles, it's, it's the largest bit that you see here. So you can see um, language privilege in operation here. You can see which one is given more value visually, very clearly. Um, and yeah, just final words. Oh, I'm sorry, it's 701. How can we learn to listen better? Um, maybe a plurilingual, pluricultural mindset can help us move more towards decolonization and things like anti-racism and working towards a better, stronger society. Um, but you know, a lot of people say that maybe people are not ready. Maybe government policy makers are not ready. Maybe school educators and administrators are not ready. And so it has to be something that's bottom up instead of top down, because we might not be able to, um, we cannot afford to wait for a government to say, let's change things up. Um, sometimes it has to start from us. And lastly, uh, an indigenous language caller, professor from the University of Toronto, I wanna to end with this again, when he said, um, it said that people revitalize a language, but really it's a language that revitalizes people. And we see this in the way that the Official Languages Act was originally conceived, right? In order to lift up the, the Anglophones and the Francophones, they wanted to make their, their languages official. Um, and so the fact that we have a multiculturalism policy and the fact that we say, oh, truth and reconciliation, the fact that we say we're, we want to lift up our indigenous brothers and sisters, but we're ignoring their language, we're ignoring their language loss and cultural loss, right? Um, how do policies like the Official Languages Act have shaped our, the way we listen to people's faces and see their voices, right? Like how come... I, we still hear comments such as this is Canada, speak English, or, um, you know, this is Quebec, par uh, français, you know, like I've, I've heard that one time yeah, when I was in, in this place called Joliet, I was speaking in English with a friend, I was teaching English there, and we were on the streets and someone just said, hey, uh, we're in Quebec, uh, speak French here, um, you know, and yeah, I'll end it there. Um, thank you so much everybody for listening and i'm um, sorry that was way longer than i thought it would be um, but i thought you found it informative and helpful and thought-provoking and i'll stop sharing my screen now